uh, the third colloquium of the, of the year at the uh, Center for Global Ethics and Politics. I'm very delighted to, delighted to uh, see all of you. Uh, I will be, uh, Sybil uh, Schwarzenbach has been at, uh, the um, Associate Director for the semester, and she was the one who lured Charles here. So I will pass this over to her after you, Carol. Um, well, you almost need no introduction, but I will give you one anyway. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Charles W. Mills, who is our last speaker for this fall uh, speaker series. Um, professor Mills is the John Evans Professor of Moral and Intellectual Philosophy at Northwestern University. His central area of research, as most, most of you know, is social and political philosophy, in particular critical or oppositional political theory, uh, focusing often on race, class, and gender. His most well-known and widely acclaimed and read around the world book, Picture Racial Contract, um, from 1997, which also won a Myers Outstanding Book Award for the study of bigotry and human rights in North America, which I thought was a nice... Um, <laughs> um, it, it's truly pathbreaking, and it has it has produced a lot of research um, projects in its wake. He is also the author of innumerable articles, as well as other books, and the latter include Blackness Visible, Essays on Philosophy and Race in, uh, from 1998, and with the feminist political theory uh, theorist Carol Pateman, he co-authored Contract and Domination um, in 2007, and his most recent work is a collection of Caribbean essays, being originally Jamaican, right? Yourself, I still guess? Jamaican. Well, still Jamaican. <laughs> you said you were a U.S. citizen on the form. But I'm still Jamaican. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, originally from Jamaica. Um, entitled Radical Theory, Caribbean Reality, Race, Class, and Social Domination, and this appeared in 2010. We're honored to have Professor Mills with us, and the important topic of his paper is Race and Global Justice. So let us welcome Charles. Well, my thanks to Sybil for that gracious introduction, and of course to both Sybil and Carol for the invitation. So the paper is about 27 pages, and we want to give you guys time to object to his criticisms, blah, blah, blah. Oh, sorry, 28 pages, so I guess I should just read the whole thing, but skip around a bit. And it was on the website for the people who want to sort of actually download it. And um, it has actually appeared, it's just a time I was worried about copyright stuff, but it does, it has actually appeared in a book. One of those, I shouldn't say this on camera, should I? Anyway, so it's appeared in um, a Rutledge publication, um, perhaps a bit steeply priced for some, $140. So I thought that I would uh, make this version of it. Okay, so race and global justice. And it's particularly appropriate, I didn't know it when I got the invitation, but I didn't know you guys were housed in this Ralph Bunch Center because you know, race was in fact one of Bunch's main preoccupations, you know, writing the world of the time. And there's a book whose title, unfortunately, I've forgotten, as with so many other things, but it's a guy called Robert Vitalis at Penn, and his book is either just out or coming out, and it's basically making a claim that a bunch of the people around him um, can be seen as basically the Howard School of International Relations, and that their analysis of the world order in that time period was far superior to you know, sort of other analyses, and you know, their analysis has stood up in a way that others haven't. And in that respect, this book, as I say, I'm credited, but um, here I'm totally the line of argument, is somewhat similar to a book by my colleague at Northwestern, Aldon Morris, who basically has a book that recently came out making a case that W.B. Du Bois should be seen as a real father of American sociology. Um, the credit is usually given to people like you know, Park at the University of Chicago. But in fact, you know, his, his work had somewhat dubious social Darwinist assumption. You know, they're not there on the surface, but it's sort of go deep enough. And that ends really Du Bois, his work on the Philadelphia Negro, and you know, those people at the University. And that because of the racism in the profession that he has not got the credit he deserves. So two very interesting interventions, one in sociology, one in international relations, both making the case that black American scholars and the people gathered around them were sort of crucial to sort of you know, um, 
laying a groundwork for his understanding the world, um, both nationally in the case of um, the boys, as well, well, the boys and girls, as well, of course, and also globally. So the theme then is race and global justice. Okay, so I begin with, um, a, as I say, a striking global analysis from the 20s, and um, I can't resist reading it, okay, so prepare to be shocked if you've never heard anything like this before. So this is a guy who's, at this stage, is anonymous, um, right in the 1920s. Of the billion and a half people in the world, the most powerful are the 400 million whites on the European and American continents. From this base, the white races have started out to swallow up other races. The American Red Aborigines are gone, the African Blacks will soon be exterminated, the brown race of India is in the process of dissolution, the yellow race of Asia are now being subjected to the white man's oppression, and may before long the white job. But the 150 million Russians, when the revolution succeeded, broke with the other white races and condemned the white man's imperialistic behavior. Now they are thinking of throwing in their lot with the weaker, smaller peoples of Asia in a struggle against the tyrannical races. So only 250 million of the tyrannical races are left, but they are still trying by human methods and military force to sub subjugate the other 1.25 billion. So hereafter, mankind will be divided into two camps. On one hand will be the 1.25 billion, on the other side the 250 million. Now we want to revive blacks, lost nationalism, and use the strength of our millions to fight for mankind against injustice. This is our divine mission. The powers are afraid that we'll have such thoughts and are setting forth a specious doctrine. They are now advocating cosmopolitanism to inflame us, declaring that as the civilization of the world advances and as mankind's vision enlarges, nationalism becomes too narrow, unsuited to the present age and hence that we should espouse cosmopolitanism. In recent years, some of Black's youth, devotees of the new culture, have been opposing nationalism, led astray by this doctrine, but it is not a doctrine which wrong races should talk about. We, the wrong races, must first recover our position of national freedom and equality before we are fit to discuss cosmopolitanism, end of quote. So the point of our leaving Black was to sort of ask the reader, who is this guy? You know, um, who's saying all this stuff in a well-known figure, so um, all will be revealed and on. <laughs> For a contemporary readership, so this is now Mills, especially one unfamiliar with the history of colonialism and anti-colonial struggles, this passage will, I suggest, be quite startling in its matter-of-factly racial framework of analysis. The author takes for granted in a way that clearly indicates he does not see it as likely to be controversial for his audience, that he and his readers are living in a world characterized by white racial domination and exterminist policy. Whites dominate the planet and are seeking to extend their rule indefinitely, if necessary through the genocide of remaining races. The reference to Africa is probably to the depredations of King Leopold II in the Belgian Congo from the late 19th to the 20th century largely forgotten in the West until Adam Hawkskill's King Leopold's ghost refreshed on the official memory 15 years ago. And Hawkskill, um, for any of you who have read that book, estimates the death toll under the regime at about 10 million people. So white supremacy is global, and a united transnational struggle of the non-white races against it is necessary for their survival. Races are not at all merely abstract sociological categories, but active social agents. The editor of the collection from which I took this excerpt characterized the author's views as social Darwinist. But if social Darwinism is committed to natural racial hierarchy, unavoidable interracial struggle, a biologistic dynamic, and the evolutionary goal of the triumph of the superior races, then this judgment, at least on the basis of this passage here, seems to me to be questionable. The author's interpretation of the Bolshevik Revolution as constituting a massive white defection the ranks of the tyrannical races, politically naive as it may appear to us a century later, show that what is presumed to be at work is not an ineluctable, biologically driven racial determinism. Options are open, and moral and political choice is possible. A class-based Marxism is clearly not taken to be incongruent with a racial struggle against global white supremacy. Whites may change sides, becoming a contemporary vocabulary, race traitors and adopt the politics of anti-imperialism and the politics of conquest. Note also that this resistance is not being represented as a struggle to achieve a racial dictatorship 
of non-whites over their oppressors, nor to prosecute a, 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 a retaliatory exterminism. Rather, what is being sought is global justice for the wronged races of mankind, a mission with divine sanction. In the writer's opinion, however, it would be a mistake at this stage to endorse a cosmopolitan ideal. Instead, a racial nationalism to restore the freedom and equality of the author's oppressed co-nationals is what is called for. Only after that has been achieved will it be appropriate to discuss the issue of cosmopolitanism. So I want to use this passage with all its obvious problems as a stalking horse to challenge the conventional frameworks in which global domination and global justice are discussed. And the author I will now reveal is Sun Yat-sen, standardly viewed as the father of modern China. You might have guessed Marcus Garvey, though imminent African extinction would certainly not have been so offhanded to mention by him. For what it does is bring home both how routinely racial categories were employed in the analysis of European colonial domination only a few decades ago, and how absent they are today from contemporary debates on the problems of globalization. <coughs> the philosophical literal global justice, as we know, has dramatically expanded in recent years, a manifestation both of the contraction of the planet through ease of communication and travel, and the worst in many respects of issues of poverty and relative underdevelopment. What might once have been the subject of an occasional article in the conscientious editor's ethics anthology is now routinely the exclusive topic of entire courses. But though a wide range of normative approaches, for example, modified Rawlsian, egalitarian, adequacy theory, cosmopolitanism, though there's a wide range of approaches typically canvassed, a commonality of this literature is the virtual absence of any discussion of race and racism. For those from the former third world, such as myself, familiar with any of the anti-colonial writings of the 19th and 20th centuries, this silence is remarkable, since the global injustice of imperialism and colonialism was classically seen, as the Sun Yat-sen excerpt makes clear, precisely as a matter of white domination over people of color. This racial dimension was not at all taken to be merely a contingent correlation, accidental and theoretically relevant, but causally central and deeply consequential. Consider the black radical political tradition, which though it has sometimes degenerated into chauvinism and racism, has at its best been both internationalist and anti-racist, seeking racial equality rather than racial revenge, and advocating a global elimination of racial hierarchy and privilege. Here we can find former slave Kwabna Kuguano, condemning in his 1787 book, The Christian Nations, not merely for the enslavement of Africans, but also for the treatment of the various Indian nations, thereby violating, and I quote, the universal natural rights and privileges of all men, among whom there are no inferior species, but all of one blood and of one nature. We also find David Walker, during his 1829 appeal, not just to his fellow black Americans, but to quote, the colored citizens of the world. Pan-Africanist Martin Delaney complained in 1852, quote, that though there are two colored persons for each white man in the world, the white race dominates the color. We have W.E.B. Du Bois at the 1900 Pan-African Conference saying that the global problem of the color line, the question as to how far differences of race are going to be made hereafter, the basis of denying to over half the world, the right of sharing to their utmost ability, the opportunities and privileges of modern civilization is the central issue, and similar in his famous 1903 The Souls of Black Folk, stating the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, the relation of the darker to the lighter race of men in Asia and Africa, in America and the islands of the sea, end quote. A judgment still being echoed more than half a century later by Franz Fanon's 1961 The Wretched of the Earth, and the famous quote here from Fanon, it is evident that what passes out the world is to begin with the fact of belonging to or not belonging to a given race, end of quote. Now admittedly, because blacks had to suffer racial slavery as against non-racial slavery of the ancient world and its stigmatizing legacy, as well as colonization, and because anti-black racism has historically been more virulent 
and more systematically and elaborately developed than any of the other varieties of colonial white racism as against anti-Semitism, because of this racial theorization has been more salient here than in any other anti-colonial and anti-imperialist tradition. A forced black diaspora, larger to the Americas, but also to Europe, generated an oppositional body of political theory for which race was a central organizing prism. But was not at all unique for the period, which is why I made a point of beginning with a Chinese nationalist rather than a black writer. So the question then is whether it is worth trying to recuperate the insights of such a racial informed internationalism in a contemporary context. Would the formal thematic introduction of race add anything of value to the current debate? If so, how? And by what means do we successfully negotiate the various conceptual and methodological hurdles on such a path? So the papers then divide into three sections where I sort of you know, try to address these questions. So the first section is race as a global institution. I'm going to skip a bit here because I start off by sort of looking at the metaphysics of race, and for this audience, maybe I don't need to sort of say too much. So um, the um, danger is, oh sorry, the, 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 the worry that critics will have is the following. It's no accident that this kind of language has disappeared. It's a good thing that it has. This language, at best, is no more than a kind of oppositional version of classic racial theory. So in Jean-Paul Sartre's famous characterization of negritude, it's an anti-racist racism. Motivationally, it's perfectly understandable, but theoretically, it's deeply problematic. It's a stage to be sublated and transcended. And those of you who know um, um, Sartre's famous, famous you know, sort of analysis of you know, um, their book, book of poetry of the time, the idea is there's sort of universal Hegelian dialectic, and that's going to sort of override this stuff. So you know, we'd, have, we'd have sort of negritude for a moment, but really, let's get on sort of universal stuff. And then you could have another objection how can this vocabulary be applied on a global scale? So these are the sort of natural responses people who are sort of not familiar with the field would have to this line of argument. So I spent some time talking about the metaphysics of race. I mean, I say that the main positions today, there's the eliminativist position, famous associated with Anthony Appiah, there's the anti-eliminativist position, and that sort of you know, subdivides into different variants. So people think that the claim that race doesn't biologically exist that's basically you know, um, an assumption you know, that it is not justified, that research in forensic anthropology and so forth shows you still have race, even if you don't have racial hierarchy. But the dominant position in critical philosophy of race is that race does not exist biologically, but exists as a social construct. There's also a kind of hybrid position, believe it or not, race exists as both. I'm going to sort of skip over that stuff. So the basic uh, assumption I've been making is that we're going to assume that race does exist, but as a social construct. So in this framework, say that race is constructed means it is brought into existence as a social convention, established by social mores, legal decisions, opportunity structures, discriminatory practices, the internalization of the racial norms and concepts, accompanying these institutions and processes, and the corresponding habits of self-categorization and other categorization developed in everyday cognition and everyday interaction. So as this distinction have made clear, such a reconceptualization of race is quite anti-biologistic in its assumptions. So the claim would be, you don't need to worry about the specter of classic racial theory. And the point of the critical and critical race theory both links it with critical theory in the sort of left tradition, Frankfurt School and so forth, and is in part to distinguish it from uncritical race theory, which of course usually just meant racist theory. So critical race theory is explicitly anti-racist in its mission and its assumptions, and it should not be seen as a non-white version of race and Wissenschaft after anything dubious like that. So over the past few hundred years, whiteness has been the central racial category, the normative reference point, the default mode. This is illustrated by a simple fact that comes naturally to us, though of course it's a social naturalness, to speak of whites and non-whites and not say of blacks and non-blacks, or to speak of whites and people of color, and not say of people of color and people of non-color. But whiteness is not natural, but as with race in general, a social construct. Hence, such literature of recent years as, and in these books are really great titles, The History of White People, The Invention of the White Race, Whiteness of a Different Color, 
how the Irish became white, how Jews became white folks, and what that says about race in America. White on arrival, white by law, and many other books. <laughs> so these books make it clear that whiteness as a social character is invented, did not exist in the pre-modern world, and its boundaries and content are conventionally determined. But this invention does not mean that it is not real. It is quite real in its social effects of privileging whites, disadvantaging people of color, shaping social opportunities, affecting public policy, determining life chances, impacting how nominal inclusive rights and freedoms are actually differentially operationalized and structured moral consciousness and one's sense of identity. As such, race could be seen not merely as an institution, but an institution so important it would arguably count as part of John Rawls's basic structure in its multidimensional social impact on the modern state. And David Theo Goldberg, um, who has is this PhD from CUNY? Mm -hmm. Yes, it yes. is, right. So, okay, so this, this is a famous race theorist who did his PhD in philosophy at CUNY, got so disgusted with the field that he exited many years ago, doesn't come to the AP, doesn't come to the philosophy journals, as you said, you know, this discipline is just hopeless. But a you know, very well-known guy, a very smart guy, so one of his, his books, the one I said, is the racial state. So you know, if you're interested in this stuff, you know, David's work is some, some, some of the work you should read. And Goldberg contends the modern state in general is a racial state. So that's the first hurdle. In other words, you shouldn't think I'm in sort of a sort of reverse racism, because critical race theory is anti-racism. But there's a second objection. Look, even if race is real, it can't be global in the appropriate way. The texts I've just cited are all American, written by Americans, referring primarily to the United States. And there's a guy called Michael Root, and he has this great line, race does not travel. So if race is a social construct, an artifact of convention, then could be argued, Surely there's going to be variation in the construction and the conventions from nation to nation, including the possibility that in some, some countries race will not exist at all. For example, myself, I'm classified as black in the United States, and I duly fill in the appropriate box on bureaucratic forms, thereby count as African American for the census and Northwestern University's faculty statistics. But in my native Jamaica, it's a different story. I count there as brown rather than black, not being dark enough. And as such, I'm fitted into what was once post-emancipation in Jamaica, the mid a three-tiered pyramid, the white, the brown, and the black. So could the critics say, even if race is global, it's a global patchwork of diverse and competing local systems rather than a planetarily uniform set of norms. And as such, it will be claimed, it can't play the kind of role this analysis is trying to impute to it. But my response, Although Ruth's aphorism does capture a constructionist truth, the reality of national variation, it is misleading insofar as it implies that there are no overarching commonalities. In both Jamaica and the United States, I will still be categorized as a person of color, someone not white, and as such on the wrong side of what is the central and most important global racial divide. And though the borders of whiteness vary, White is a transnational category for the simple reason that is established by European expansionism, European imperialism, and European colonialism. As Howard Wynant writes in an important book, the result of this process is an immense planetary metamorphosis that leads to the creation of a world racial system. And there's an increasing body of work trying to extend critical race theory beyond US shores, there's stuff being done in Australia, the British theorist Steve Garner works an introduction. So we can expect the part of this literature to expand and get, get sort of look for more detailed and fine-grained case studies of race and whiteness across the world, not just in the US, that both address such variations and document the underlying commonalities. Final objection. A global whiteness could have no explanatory power. Well, it's not a matter of an accidental and causally otuous correlation, like foot size, so that the people in the imperial countries all have a size 12 feet, whereas these people in us, it's not like that. Now, it's not that, it's not Rasenkampf, so they use Nazi language, or they don't have historical association, such a term will evoke. It's a matter of people being categorized in a certain way, internalizing that categorization, growing up in a world structured around such categories, and leading lives in the light of that ascribed, empowering or disempowering identity. 
The phrase I use in the racial contract, I, I was quite proud of myself at the time, um, global white supremacy. And you might think, Jesus Christ, you know, what's wrong with this guy? I mean, these extremist third worlders or whatever. But in my um, and this paper was written um, in uh, 2014, so I'm going to use the same. Imagine we jump in the time machine and set the controls for a trip of a century backward. Emerging in early 1914, what will we find? We'll find a world on the eve of World War I, which is completely dominated by the colonial empires. British, French, Dutch, Belgian, German, Portuguese, Russia. By Edward Said's estimate, 85% of the earth at the time is under some kind of control by the European powers. White European nations rule over, rule over non white nations. China is now formally colonized, but is under European hegemony. More with the independent countries like the white settler states, that's the US, Canada, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, it is again whites are the dominant group with widespread formal and informal discrimination against Aboriginal peoples in countries where they had slavery, discrimination against the descendants of black slaves being the North. In the Latin American nations, which gained their independence in the 19th century, whites and the light-skinned are contra the midst of racial democracy, and an all-inclusive, if you'll forgive my bad Spanish, mestizaje, it's a good thing Linda isn't here, um, they are economically, socially, politically, and culturally privileged over the darker and the, in, and the na native. In sum, across most of the globe, whites are the rulers, both internationally and nationally. The few independent nations of color, black nations like Haiti and Ethiopia, the Asian nation of Japan, all have to operate within a white-dominated world and are all constrained by its norms and power relationships. None of these facts is enough. They can be found in an objective history book. What is lacking is the theoretical will to recognize their implications, the refusal to put them together into a composite picture. It might also be objected that global white supremacy implies a single coordinating and governing body, say a White House made at the North Pole that is not American, but globally empowered and authoritative. But a planet dominated <coughs> by sub-planetary political entities that are themselves white-ruled, is still, though polycentric, white-ruled overall, even if there's no white world state as such. For though there was no centralized planetary seat of formal white governing power, the whites the world over are divided by national membership, citizens of countries sometimes in conflict with each other, and in turn divided by class and gender, they are nonetheless binding transoceanic and transsocial links. Racial ideologies circulate globally. Assumptions of non-white inferiority and the legitimacy of white rule are taken for granted. A shared colonial history of pacts, treaties, international jurisprudence, and a racial slash religious self-conception of being the bearers and preservers of civilization provide common norms and reference points. So the whiteness is not causally relevant which shapes people's conception of themselves and others, their views of their group interests, their collective and individual identities, the political and moral framework within which they understand the world. And in doing this kind of work, what I found very useful is not, to your surprise, to a non-surprise philosophy, which is pretty useless for most of these things, what I found useful is work in like um, sort of work being done in political theory, and work being done in critical IR, critical international relations. There's a bunch of people in international relations are sort of challenging the sort of mainstream hegemony, which has sort of written race out of the picture. And you have, you have these books on decolonizing international relations, which are starting to talk about the centrality of race in this period. And I'm quoting here from one of these authors, um, Branwen Griffith Jones. The belief in a hierarchy of peoples the superiority of Europeans or people with European ancestry and the inferiority of non-Europeans or people of color was widespread and routine. A generally unquestioned assumption embedded both in public and personal European imagination and the formal institutions of European and international order." End quote. So I'm claiming that this concept, which might seem an extremist, which might seem a sort of wacko, and any sort of crazy black people's crazy third worlders, the concept of white supremacy, which is global, which when first encountered may seem obviously problematic, is actually theoretically quite defensible. 
And in fact, it is now being used by some historians, white historians, so that's important. When white people start using it, then you know. <laughs> so there's a guy called Martin Borstelman, and he refers to, quote, the era of global white supremacy, the international character of white rule over people of color. <clears throat> Continuing differences in the racial distribution of power and wealth confirm the ongoing relevance of this theme to contemporary national history. And similar to Australian historians, Marilyn Lake and Henry Reynolds, and they have a book whose title pays tribute to Du Bois, Drawing the Global Color Line, White Men's Countries and the International Challenge of Racial Equality. So Italian philosopher Domenico Lasordo has a book, Liberalism and Counter History, um, based a sort of you know, expose, in, um, you know, this, you know, those, the sort of record of liberalism is even worse than you dreamed. You know, it's not merely the sexist and racist stuff, even the white male working class, if you think of how late the white male working class gets the sort of rights we associate with, with modernity, such as the right to vote, and liberalism is based on complicity with it. So in this book, Liberals and Counter History, one of his titles, one of his chapters has this great title, The West and the Barbarians, a Master Race Democracy on a Planetary Scale. So in effect, I suggest these contemporary scholars are recovering a concept that was quite obvious and uncontroversial to theories and acts of the color of the period, but which seems strange to us now because of the efficiency of the post-war West's erasure of the centrality of race to its rule. Embarrassed both by the death camps demonstration of where the logic of racism leads, that is, even Europeans could be subjected to mass murder, and by a colonial discourse no longer appropriate for a post-colonial world, if only nominally so, the West in the post-war period sought to white out in multiple ways, race and racial ideology underpinned its global domination. But we need to recover this past, both so as better to understand it and to enable us to dismantle the legacy that's left behind. <laughs> okay, so second section, <coughs> liberalism and race. So the case I make here is that we need to understand how liberalism in its evolution historically has been shaped by race. For the seeming demise of Marxism, liberalism is now the globally dominant ideology. As such, it constitutes an ethical, juridical set of concepts, norms and principles, underlying assumptions and overarching narratives, which would necessarily be a central reference point for debate, whether as an accepted framework or one to be challenged, modified and built upon. And at least until recently, liberalism has sanitized its racial past. And the, the accounts you get, for example, in textbooks and encyclopedias basically center on Europe and focus on the white male population, telling this inspirational narrative of the triumph of moral egalitarianism over you know, pre-modern ascriptive hierarchy. So John Locke's victory over Sir Robert Fillmore. But once this tale is set in this global context and the focus broadened to include white women and people of color, i.e. the majority of the world's population, we appreciated that the actual story is very different. <clears throat> and race, you know, the, the um, gender critique, you know, is very, very familiar to us because of several decades of feminist theory. Race, with respect to people of color, has part the theoretical and normative rationale for reconciling liberal inclusion and liberal exclusion. And there's a long list of works, again, I'm citing here, all from political theorists. The Barbara Arneal, John Locke in America, Ule Sigmeta, Liberalism and Empire, Jennifer Pitts, A Turn to Empire, James Tolley, Imperialism and Civil Freedom. Oh, sorry, I forgot one philosopher, Thomas McCarthy's recent book, Race, Empire, and Human, and, and Human Development. And they're basically sort of mapping what to use uh, Pitts' phrase, we can see as an imperial liberalism, in which is not merely that they're pejorative characterizations of Native Americans and Native Australians, Africans and Asians, but the key concepts of liberalism as a theory are shaped by this imperial logic. And that's, of course, the really sort of crucial point, because obviously contemporary liberals will in sort of you know, quickly disavow any sort of racist references in the sort of classic texts, um, books, cl uh, sort of classic um, you know, writings to people of color. But the question is whether such excisions are sufficient to address possibly deeper structural biases in terms of crucial assumptions, framings, norms, and narratives. So if liberalism is the salvage, and here, of course, I'm doing a reformist thing to the outrage of many of my left friends who say, well, trying to salvage, you know, this dead theory. So if liberalism is to be salvage, and shouts from the audience, no, 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 it's not. <laughs> if liberalism is to be salvage, if you want to develop an anti-imperial liberal theory, 
<coughs> yeah, or um, in a in a um, Sanka Mutu, this, this is the Gen 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 part, um, he has his book Enlightenment Against and Empire. How can this be done? And in political theory, there's already a significant body of work <coughs> seeking to address this issue by engaging nuts and bolts issues of constitutional reform, indigenous autonomy, for example, um, Native Canadians, Native Australians, and so forth. So the question is, what is the challenge for philosophers? In other words, what is the distinctive contribution? They said that we can make a contribution to What is the distinctive contribution <laughs> that philosophers can make? Okay, I suggest that the feminist example on gender could be illuminated as a model to be followed for race. Second way, feminist philosophers faced with the task of advancing a feminist agenda in a theoretical conceptual universe dominated by male frameworks took various approaches. One was to repudiate liberalism and Marxism at a time when Marxism was still seen as a viable contender in the name of a distinctive, radically new theory that putatively owed nothing to masculinist thought in any form. But another approach was to argue that liberalism's key assumptions and values were not intrinsically problematic, but needed to be rethought in the light of its sexist exclusions. So one asks oneself the question, how counterfactually would liberalism have developed had its leading thinkers not taken female subordination for granted? What kind of liberalism would one get if the public-private divide had not been drawn in such a way as to exclude women from political life and social justice? So in this strategy, rather than regarding this body of thought as liberalism as such, which cannot be changed, you frame it self-consciously as a liberalism that's patriarchal and then try to go beyond its epistemic horizon. So the idea is, you say, here's this body of theory, which just presents itself as liberalism, but in fact, it's a liberalism that's patriarchal. It can be retrieved, but we need to sort of self-consciously sort of recognize you know, its origins, its genealogy, why it has developed that way, before we can do an adequate job of being sort of you know, rec recommending how the frameworks, or the conceptual divisions, or the normative theory needs to be rethought. <laughs> and I'm basically arguing that this is a useful strategy that can be followed for people working on race. Mm -hmm. So that in the same way that you know, patriarchy and gender theory, you know, I mean, that subsect, and obviously I know there are many feminist theories who sort of read the in any form, but for those people are sort of taking this line and saying that you, know, you basically sort of theorize liberalism in sort of light of you know, pa patriarchal frame and how it develops, I'm suggesting similarly, we theorize liberalism in the framework of global white supremacy, sort of understand why it develops that way, and we then ask ourselves, how can an anti-racist liberalism be developed that self-consciously takes this history into account? Reconceptualizing liberal in this way, I suggest, would have several virtues. To begin with, it would make clear the intimate historical connection between liberalism and race, so that the study of the racial shaping of the thought of many of the central figures of the modern Western canon, so for example, Locke, Hume, Mill, Hegel, Hegel, could thus become a legitimate research area within the field. And again, the feminists in the room would be very familiar with you know, the feminist project and sort of early state of second wave feminist theory, where it's sort of you know, discovering the extent to which the canonical figures are really just addressing themselves to men and a woman have a subordinate role, so there's a sort of process of sort of looking at sort of you know, sexism in Locke, in Hume, and so forth, and then of course, for those who think that they can still retreat, you know, so, sort of work out how it's to be done. So you have the Penn State the series, for example, feminists rethink the canon, self-conscious attempt, okay, is Locke hopeless, or can get positive things out of him, and then similar for, for other theories. So the debate on race in many respects is sort of you know, far behind the feminist um, project, because of the sort of unrepresentation of people of color. But we can see very easily how parallel moves could be, could be made. So that's, that's one obvious point. Secondly, to open the conceptual door for the admission to the canon of thinkers in the black, anti-colonial, and third world traditions of political philosophy, whose central focus historically was, of course, precisely white racism and European domination. So the construction of Western political philosophy as raceless has the ideological consequence, not merely of misrepresenting its own actual past, but of erecting a convenient <coughs> cordon sanitaire between it and the oppositional anti-racist tradition of people of color. So a theorist of the statue of W.B. Du Bois, for example, can be excluded from the canon because his work is preoccupied with the issue of racial subordination and how to overcome it. 
And since racial subordination is not recognized as political, or even as existent, his work cannot be political philosophy. Thus we get the absurd situation of a white tradition representing itself as colorless and separate from the black tradition when it is precisely because of its exclusionary racist whiteness that the oppositional black tradition has had a common existence in the first place. And the third point, it would help to end the ghettoization of contemporary political philosophers who work on race who are currently regarded as pursuing an idiosyncratic agenda, marginal to the mainstream of the profession. So critical of philosophy of race would not then be viewed as a field unto itself, a self-created intellectual ghetto, sharply conceptually separated from mainstream political philosophy, but as offering a distinctive perspective on that subject matter that needs to engage with. So we have a kind of Jim Crowing, a conceptual Jim Crowing in the world of political philosophy in terms of a sort of you know, white set of concerns and then you know, people of color sort of work into the cell. So through this desegregation of intellectual worlds, the conceptual space would then be opened up for rethinking of descriptive and normative political philosophy in the light of this unacknowledged history. So think, for example, of locks, self-owning appropriators, confronted with the non-self-owning Frederick Douglass. Think of Kant's cosmopolitanism in critical dialogue with Edward Said's. Think of Hegel's world spirit, challenged by the boys' indictment of global whiteness. Personhood, rights, freedom, democracy, recognition, autonomy, property, self-ownership, civilization, the nation-state. How might all of these have to be rethought once the history of imperialism and colonialism is taken into account and its influence on the shaping of all of these concepts is made the subject of philosophical investigation. Hang in there, guys, final section. Race and the rethinking of justice. Let us turn now to justice. There is a chasm between the professional literature on justice produced by philosophers and the popular discussions of the subject, both in the United States and at least historically global. global. Racial justice are the main banners under which the American civil rights movement and to a significant extent, the global anti-colonial movement marched. Yet in the tremendous revival of Anglo-American political philosophy over the past 40 years stimulated by John Rawls, a theory of justice, it is a phrase and a topic that is virtually completely absent. Whether directed at national or global justice, this huge body of work has almost nothing to say about racial justice. And I, I quote a long list of examples, and um, the um, latest one which came out after this paper was written, is the Blackwell <coughs> Companion to Rawls, edited by David Reedy and Jay Mandel. It's a book of nearly 600 pages, and of those 600 pages, there's like a grand total of one and a half pages on race. The performative action, the index, you will get a single endnote reference consisting of a single sentence. So this is in like more than 40 years after the of Justice came out, it's still the case that mainstream white political philosophers have not made the transition talking about non-ideal theory and race. What explains the science? In my opinion, there's a confluence of factors. First, there's a demographic whiteness of the profession, about 98% in the United States. Insofar as even within a subject as abstract as philosophy, group experience and group privilege play a role in influencing concerns and interests, we would expect that those of historical being the beneficiaries of racial injustice would tend to have less interest in exploring the topic than those who have been its victims. And again, the feminist analogy is illuminating. <coughs> Compare the non-discussion of gender justice as a topic in philosophy before the relative influx of women into the profession from the 1970s onwards. That's number one. Second, there's the whiteness of the tradition itself. The fact that race has not generally been an issue critically examined in white philosophy as against uncritically endorsed in racist statements by white um, mainstream figures. Third, it might be felt that race is not really a respectable category and that racial justice can be subsumed into other kinds of justice. But in any case, it is really, really done, done. And then fourth, we have the problem which is not peculiar to philosophy, but is exacerbated in philosophy because of the disciplinary abstraction away from the empirical, the problem of the sanitization of the racist historical record by the academies of European colonial powers and the offshoots such sort as of the United States. And if you want a really sort of illuminating set of documents, you know, go to your library and look up American high school textbooks from the 1950s, sort of see how slavery was described, for example, you know, 
sort of gone with the wind version of slavery. You know, you're sipping your mint, mint julep on the plantation veranda. The dark is us singing in the cotton fields, all is well with the world. So with a few honorable exceptions, it's been a history of whitewash. This long past of racial atrocity, which is now deeply embarrassing, so you need to deny it or downplay. And then finally, I suggest a sort of crucial factor, the overwhelming orientation of the field to what Walt Rawls called ideal theory. The theory of distributive justice appropriate for a perfectly just society. Not only did this orientation postpone matters of non-ideal theory to such time ever receding over the horizon, as ideal theory would have been properly worked out, but it marginalized as a peripheral concern the historically accurate mapping of the past with which compensatory justice is definitionally concerned. The question then is, how do we redress this sit this, this set of problems? So my argument is that what we need to do is to explicitly shift from ideal to non-ideal theory. And there is beginning to be a body of work on non-ideal theory within philosophy, but for the most part, it's non, not non-ideal theory as centered on issues of corrective justice. And it then means that the sort of distinctive problems you know, raised by racial justice are not dealt with. Because the thing about race, part of the thing about the awareness of race, if you think about it, if you accept the analysis of race as a social construct, brought in existence by discriminatory social processes, then in an ideal theory, in Rawls's in you know, a sort of perfect just society, race would not even exist. It's not that you have races, but no history of discrimination against them. The very social entities, race, would not exist. So by putting yourself in the framework of ideal theory, there's a sense in which you are sort of moving yourself in this radically different world, not merely epistemologically, in the sense that you know, there's sort of no discussion of these matters, but metaphysically, in that you know, world in which races don't exist. And even if you could say it's been an attractive social goal to move toward a world where races are sort of taken out of existence, that's not the same as a world where they never existed in the first place. So you need to deal with a world where races do exist, so that you then put sort of public policy measures into place that will sort of lead to their going out of existence. And that's not the same as a world where they didn't come into existence in the first place. So I then sort of um, wind up things by some quotes from people like Pogan. Okay, so final section. <clears throat> the conceptual shift from distributive to corrective justice from the distributive norms of a well-ordered society to the corrective norms for an ill-ordered society is thus crucial and can, in my opinion, be seen as roughly the equivalent for race theory of the feminist challenge to the drawing of the public-private demarcation for gender theory. The key insight of second-wave feminism was that the way the private sphere was demarcated from the public sphere was theoretically pivotal, since gender justice as a normative issue was then conceptually obfuscated. If justice happened in the public sphere, the state and the marketplace, not in the family and the household, which were beyond justice. Here, the approximate homologue is the realization that what Rawls calls compensatory justice cannot, for race, be achieved within this conceptual framework, and that ideal theory, rather than providing the best theoretical foundation upon which to do non-ideal theory adequately, as Rawls claimed, actually obstructs its mission. So the very orientation towards ideal theory has not merely been left these issues contingently unaddressed, but structurally unaddressable. That is, the apparatus itself, I'm claiming, is inimical to carrying out this normative agenda. So what we need to do, I'm suggesting, is that we need to sort of make corrective justice far more central to the global justice disputes that they have been. And one of the virtues of doing this is that insofar as for liberals across the political spectrum, left to right, um, the correction of the violation of negative rights is imperative, then you know, doing this might bring about a greater degree of convergence than you know, distributive justice approaches, given the sort of huge variation between libertarians, egalitarians, royalists, etc., on what distributive justice requires of us. There's a guy called Daniel Bott at Oxford, who has this book, Rectifying International Injustice, which I'm just going to quote from here. So this is Bott speaking. It is hard to maintain that there's a great deal of real-world support for redistributive cosmopolitanism. Given the apparent lack of public support for global egalitarianism, 
it may well be that the best political strategy for those who support extensive redistribution is not to seek to challenge the deeply held foundational principles of railroad political actors, but to maintain that these very principles, if properly understood, call for a substantial global redistribution of resources. Accordingly, the account of harm given in this book draws upon paradigm cases of unjust international interaction, end of book. So Bott is basically saying, if you look at the colonial and imperial history, you have all these atrocities being committed, you have all these sort of massive violations of rights, which even liberals on the political right should be able to concede. And that if we sort of, and try to sort of establish the link between that history and the present world order, and in my case, I'm suggesting that the case was sort of break is strengthened and make it very central to the argument, you have a situation you can then sort of go to people on the political right of the liberal spectrum and say, we're not asking you to be cosmopolitans or egalitarians or Rawlsians. We're saying you know, that by your own commitment, sort of Lockean rights of life, liberty, and property, you should be able to see that you know, massive redistribution is sort of called for. So we're sort of you know, using you know, a kind of Nozickian approach in a sense that Nozick concedes that you know, when you have sort of violations of these rights, you need corrective justice. You're applying it on a global scale. Okay, so finally, guys, let me just wrap up by pointing out another dimension of that, which is the following. It's not merely a matter of the strength to which you sort of make the argument, but it's a question of what is morally appropriate. And part of the problem I'm suggesting with the distributive approaches is that it sidesteps the question of a sort of multidimensionality of you know, the corrective justice for historic wrongs. Let us say black Americans, who are the descendants of slaves or Australian Aborigines, suffering from, from, from their ancestors' expropriation, or third world peoples impoverished because of the colonization of their country. Let's suppose they were to receive a transfer of resources because their governments or because international bodies have been won over by egalitarian arguments or roles and commitment to remedy the situation of the worst off. It would still be the case, I'm claiming that they would not have gotten their due for reparations to be made, for the wrong against them and their ancestors to be corrected, what is required is not merely a physical transfer of resources, but a transfer taking place under a description and on a normative foundation that make it a certain kind of action and not another kind. If the narrative that philosophers like Thomas McCarthy and myself believe is roughly true, then distributive justice approaches, roles in or otherwise, are failing to target the actual wrong involved. We need to sort of you know, look at this in terms of the history of sort of correcting wrongs and thus bring in all kinds of symbolic dimensions and you know, issues of um, an apology, um, condemnation of perpetrators, memorialization, and these issues simply do not arise if it's just a matter of you know, distributive justice. Moreover, this applies not just to the living but the dead also, which is why you have the creation the post war period of Holocaust memorial museums. But the question to be asked is, where are the memorials for all of Europe's other dead? The Third Reich is universally condemned, but what about the West Reich? Where are the memorials for Spain's Amerindian Holocaust, or the Congolese who died under Belgian rule, or the Nama and Herero people exterminated by the very Nictums in German Southwest Africa, or the Ethiopians and Libyans gassed in Italy's colonial wars, or the Kikuyo slaughtered in the British counterinsurgency campaign in Kenya, or the Algerians subjected to torture and massacre by French troops, or the millions of Africans who perished in the Atlantic slave trade. What is required is a global truth and reconciliation commission that would bring to light these suppressed histories and pay the appropriate respect to this huge, unmarked, and unacknowledged non white necropolis. And I suggest that's against this background, and also going back to Sun Yat Sen's statement. I suggest that in the cosmopolitanism he was facing in his time could be seen as the global conceptual equivalent of the color blindness and post raciality non hegemonic among the white population in the United States. And that race, I'm suggesting, can only be transcended by facing and working through it, not by evading and trying to have sublated it. A liberalism and a cosmopolitanism that fail to deal with race will continue to be a racial liberalism and cosmopolitanism. <coughs> incapable of prescribing the measures of rectificating racial justice necessary not just for dismantling the long-established structures of racial domination, but also for transforming white psych moral psychology and consciousness, thereby laying the foundations for a new, genuinely post-racial world. Thank you.
sort of appealing to violations of sort of rights that are sort of seen on the sort of right or liberal spectrum, making the case that um, corporations and sort of international group agreements and so forth do constitute violations of this kind. So I see the sort of line I'm arguing of here taking a sort of complementary to what he's doing. And the whole thing is within a rights frame, because bear in mind, you know, it's, um, it's trying to be a liberal approach, and of course, there are different kinds of liberalism, there's utilitarian liberal theory. But I mean, uh, since um, World War II or so, it's more been sort of rights-based liberal theories, Kantian liberal theories, that have become what, well, um, well maybe I should say since Rawlsianism, have become much more influential. So, you know, you, it's not that you, you saw it, it's not the case that this approach is sort of opposed to rights-based approach. It's taken for granted that in the rights there, these rights were violated, that you know, African slaves are a violation of people's rights, Native American expropriation of people, violation of people's rights, and so forth. I'm just saying that I think that the argument of people like Paul would strengthen if we sort of look at you know, the extent to which the histories are so clearly racist and to sort of you know, bring out you know, the extent to which these massive rights violations were rationalized through a sort of <coughs> racist set of norms which basically made these peoples less than full persons which so that then means you can get away with doing to them stuff that, that you'd be prohibited from doing your fellow your, your, your in terms of the plausibility I agree with you at last that um, prospects are not great so the, so there's a sort of general problem when you're trying to use moral suasion to overcome significant vested material interest in an existing order so I'm just saying that that's a sort of overarching problem that any product of moral suasion is going to face but that at least you can uh, you don't have to face additional handicap of making the moral case in a vocabulary and a political framework that is rejected by the mainstream. So that is sort of an additional work, whereas, you know, you then be saying on this approach, if you guys are good liberals, then redistribution is called for on these grounds. That doesn't mean that everyone overbuys that, but the question is, you know, 
it, will, will any form of moral suasion win, win them over? Yeah. To the extent that a moral argument has some purpose, I just think it would sort of strong, strong it sort of takes this kind of approach. Oh, um, I wanted to press you a little bit on, on what you said about uh, distributive versus sure. corrective yeah. justice at the end. Um, I wasn't sure uh, if you had left any room in your account for distributive justice. You did say it was what you were rejecting as distributive justice for sort of ideal conditions. Um, but you could reject the Rawlsian distinction between ideal and non-ideal theory and still have a theory of distributive oh, justice sure. which is distinct from a theory of corrective justice. Yes, of so I, want, I wanted you to say a little bit more about how you saw the relationship between those two because there's been a fair amount of writing, Jeremy Waldron and others have written about the tensions mm -hmm. between distributive and corrective justice and I wonder if you could say more about how that plays out specifically with respect to introducing race as a central mm -hmm. feature of corrective justice. Okay, um, you're certainly correct that you can't, I mean, you would be crazy to get rid of distributive justice because, I mean, even if all the injustices have been corrected, you're still then going to have sort of norms about you know, how you need to proceed from here. I'm just saying that the overwhelming focus of a lot of the literature, it seems to me, has been on distribution rather than correction, and you know, has to me, has evaded the colonial and imperial history. And you know, insofar as I think racism has been central to that history, then I think that in cases where it's clear cut, and of course you could say that nothing in this area will be clear cut because apart from the question of competing values, there's going to be the question of competing historical stories. So that you know, I'm presupposing a certain historical story. And it could be that other theorists will say, your story doesn't really stand up. It's not the case that in what we now call third world nations, that the current state of our development can be traced back to this. So you know, it's not the case that you can sort of take that as an uncontroversial given, and then say, given this history, such and such follows. So there are all those complications there. But insofar as you can make it seem a plausible case that in the situation of some peoples is a result of this sort of past history, then it seems to me that in a um, corrective justice should be sort of more upfront and central because of the fact that there's supposed to be a greater degree of convergence on corrective justice insofar as even liberals on the political right would be dubious about Rawls' fair part of opportunity principle, or the difference principle, or egalitarianism, are supposed to support you know, non-violation of the negative rights to life, liberty, and property. So insofar as these rights you know, were clearly violated, you think, by African slavery, by Jim Crow, by colonialism, then when you can sort of you know, map out this causal sort of um, sequence and say these populations today are in the position they're in you know, because of this history, it seems to me that you know, the appeal to rectificatory justice is more natural there both for the question of, you know, um, it's been sort of harder to refute, and also because of the symbolic aspect of things. So in the case of Native Australians, um, I can't remember who it was, but, but the Labour government were elected, and, um, you know, where, where the Conservative government had not been listening to their, to, to the, their demands. The Labour government, to a certain extent, there was, I think, a national sorry day, which is easy to sort of parody and say, well, you know, they're not that sorry because they're really sorry, but then they give money and not just claim they're sorry. But you can see how there are a whole set of you know, symbolic aspects to it, and these symbolic aspects are not part of the distributive justice paradigm because it's not the case that the distributive justice paradigm is saying that the situation of these people today is a result of this past wrong done. I guess I'm, I'm not Wait, quite... Do you... We're going to have to shorten the, you're going to have to shorten your answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. But no, well, let's, 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 let the sound right, talk. No follow-up. Continue, no follow-up okay. until okay. we get everybody okay. and then. Less, less long than that. Yeah, sorry. Because yeah. yeah. there are a lot. You go ahead. Um, are we, oh, are, are you, you, no, no, you were doing it. If oh, you want good. me to do it, I'll do it. Okay, let's um, do it. I'll just be the do, police. Do um, <laughs> let's let's do it side by side. So, so this side now, Carol. So that uh, in your critical section, I, I very much appreciated the emphasis on what used to be called the critique of ideology um, in terms of, uh, which is probably not what you had in mind exactly, but some idea of bringing uh, the need to transform concepts in view of their having been 
supposedly neutral, but really obscuring some white interests or you know some kind of particular interest. But then uh, I'm wondering about whether that's consistent with um, what you end up seem to want to end up with, or what you formulate as either in terms of just bring focus on non-ideal theory. It could be consistent with that, provided you reconstruct the ideal theory. But then, and so it's really just, again, the question of, wouldn't it require transformations in some of the basic liberal concepts, um, some of the basic commitments to take more into account uh, you know, relational conceptions of people, or um, freedom is more than just autonomy, but having sure. to do with access to conditions, sure. or various other, and of course, a more a deeply utilitarian reading, presumably. Sure. So, sure. how is that, how, in what way did you want to look at it as just a reassertion of liberalism? Mm -hmm. in, um, in what I want to say is that there's, you could see in a sense there are two projects. There's a more kind of centrist, sort of centrist, rightist project, in the sense that it's claiming that you can get lots of radical stuff, um, even if you sort of make use of liberal values to the right and liberal spectrum. In addition to that, my own sympathies are on the left side. So, you know, if you were to ask me, what I mean, do you think that a liberalism of the right is going to be sort of suitable for addressing all these other kinds of this? Then I'd say no. But for the sort of specific purpose of the history of racial injustice, I don't think that you need a liberalism of the left. And I don't think you need a, a reconstitutional liberal principle that is that radical. I think that you just need to sort of pay close attention to the actual racial history, the extent to which in the structures of white domination, sort of prevent people from having equal opportunity and so forth, so that by those sort of very weak and sort of minimal liberal commitments, you can get radical stuff out of them. But in addition, I'm sort of in agreement with you on the sort of need for a left reconstruction of liberal theory. I'm just saying that this is the purpose of the racial justice, well, the corrective racial justice project. I don't think that you need it for, for that. <laughs> oh, right, so we'll go, we'll go on to, to, to this side. Yes, uh, yes. Now I'm curious if you could justify that position a little bit more. I mean, specifically, I'm thinking of how your project relates to um, du Bois's conception of Pan-Africanism, okay. because I think it's very much sympathetic with it, especially in your attempt to move beyond cosmopolitanism mm -hmm. in a trying to build an account of repertory justice that's not simply about moral rights, but about economic <coughs> power and labor um, and this question of symbolism. And what's interesting with Du Bois is that in um, advocating Pan-Africanism, he also emphasizes local power and specifically the issue of the nation-state, and you don't say much about it. So. Right, but um, economic stuff and instances of exploitation, and you know, um, to use the liberal term on just enrichment, that's, that part should not be incompatible with the liberal framework, because there is a liberal part of literature in a liberalism of the right, talking about property and so forth. So if you sort of take as a starting point that blacks' property rights are violated by slavery, that um, you get, to use a liberal term, unjust enrichment. You then get a situation where blacks are not allowed to compete freely on the market because of the patterns of discrimination against them. I think you sort of use all that apparatus and get in a sort of radical inclusion. So um, the, the, the philosopher now Box uh, did this paper years ago saying you can use luck to argue for black rep, 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 reparations. I mean, I need to think it back down. <laughs> this is really what it just goes to show. So if Locke himself had based on the slave trade, Locke himself had tried the Caroline Constitution, nonetheless, an anti-racist Locke, who sort of committed to things like self-ownership and so forth, sort of apply that and uh, ask yourself, um, is it the case that you know, enslaved Africans were um, kept in a just war, which is what would have been required by Locke and norms for them to be justifiably enslaved, and of course, even then, you can't enslave their wives and children, so there's a sort of massive violation going on of Locke's own principles. So I think you'll get a lot of radical stuff out of there, even from a liberalism of the right, these issues of you know, um, property, exploitation, white privilege, and so forth. In terms of nationalism, if you mean a tension between nationalism and um, li lib liberal, liberal theory, um, the stuff from um, Tom Shelby's book, We Go Dark, so I sort of demarcate different elements within black nationalism and claim that there's some versions that are compatible with um, liberal norms. 
So I just think that um, there's a lot of stuff here in liberalism which wants you sort of take account of the specific sort of situation of blacks and the violations of their rights. You can sort of use it and get radical conclusions that you might not think are possible because you know our consciousness is so dominated by the liberalism that we know. So this is a kind of radical liberal theory. I see you're skeptical, but we can talk. <laughs> Uh, okay, somebody on this side, yes. Um, Eric. Thank you. Um, so, you know, you, if we want to reform or influence philosophers to do more non-ideal theory rather than ideal theory, and we want to implement corrective measures, um, I wonder what, uh, how you think your own notion of white ignorance, whether that's like a technical term of, um, you know, how whiteness um, prevents or affects cognition such that certain evidence is not salient sure. in regards to you know what what's true. Right. So um, I wonder, you know, is that something you have to handle before? Is it part of the project? Um, you know, what, where, where do you stand on it? It's certainly a major ongoing obstacle. Um, here's um, a startling stat which I've been <clears throat> telling with a kind of lugubrious delight I would sense to audiences, so get ready for it, guys. Um, <laughs> so there's this Tufts, I think Tufts Business School at Harvard, and in some, some respect, I guess, they, they, they did this poll a few years ago. They asked white Americans, which is a race most likely to be subject to discrimination? And a majority of white Americans said, it's, it's us, it's, it's white, white. <laughs> so you can see how a racial justice project in this kind of milieu is going to have sort of serious obstacles to its realization, obviously. And it's just, you know, there's a black guy in the White House, so in an awkward there's still be, you know, white domination. So you have to try to overcome a lot of stuff. Um, you have to point to a history that you know, many white Americans, you know, the stuff I was saying about in the high school textbooks, that has long-term repercussions in terms of the concepts and narrative white Americans then bring to bear on these issues. So it's, it's in part because of the occlusion of that history of um, you know, um, 90 years of um, segregation you know, after, um, in, after, after the Civil War, after emancipation, that then gets erased. That you can then say, well, slavery was a long time ago. How come you guys are still bitching about that? So a massive educational program would be required. Now, why it's going to be receptive? Um, probably not. So how do you make them receptive? Well, in other work, I've argued that you try to combine a racial justice agenda with a broader class justice agenda. What you try to do is you try to split off the section of the white population who are more vulnerable, those who are poor, those who are unemployed. So, as you know, um, Thomas Piketty's book says, this is the New Gilded Age, okay? So there's the 1870s, where never twain did his book, and then the 1920s, Roy has another Gilded Age. This, this is a New Gilded Age. This is the way it's going to be. And the United States in particular, as you know, is the most unequal of all the Western democracies. So you try to make a case to some section of the white population, this deal is not working so great for you either anymore. And you try to advocate for a transracial alliance, which will not sort of you know, bury racial justice as an agenda, but have it as a sort of separate component, along with a sort of social democratic agenda, the idea being that this alliance would provide a sort of stronger basis for challenging plutocracy than what you've historically had. And the history, for example, when you know, the, um, Roosevelt's New Deal, for example, basically betrays blacks and the terms are written so that agricultural workers and domestics are excluded because of the influence of the South, and that meant blacks didn't benefit, that the GI Bill was implemented in a racial way and so forth. So this sort of long history of um, sort of you know, state transfer payments being um, done in such a way as to exclude blacks or sort of not give blacks their due. So you can't have a social democracy, to the extent that that counts as social democracy, steps towards it. You can't have a social democracy on that basis, given sort of long side history. So you then have an alliance, you know, cross racial lines, and you're know, using the argument that the reason capitalism is so extreme in this country, the reason that it's plutocratic rather than sort of anything more we distribute this, has had to do precisely with the fact that, you know, you've had a working class, a white working class, which has basically sort of large, historically, has not allied itself with blacks, but have basically let their racial identities trump their class identities. So it would not be a sort of moral suasion argument on its own, 
into the more Swedish American plus, plus a group interest area. Uh, so that question is over here. It's all in the front row. Um, is this? Can you? Can how many people have questions? Let's just. Okay. Well then. Oh. Okay. Well, there are a few. Okay. okay so. Yes. So. Because uh, we have ten more minutes. Charles, so. that was a great talk, and thanks, thanks. for sharing it. You you said along the way that all the people on the left are going to be shouting in my nose. Yes. Yes. Have a little bit of that. Yes. Uh, so maybe here I'm with Carol and, and Elvira, but I, to me, I mean, I guess the this the sort of obvious counter move yeah. in assuming the conversation is if you're going to engage in this kind of historical analysis where you say here's this thing liberalism and if we rewind the clock historically and look yes. at it genealogically we see white supremacy built there at its very sure. foundations sure. and then you say well let's try and exercise that yes. but the other the other thought is well that kind of genealogy we yeah. can't yeah. the to me in the first time you mentioned capitalism was in the last reply and to me it seems to me that there's an you know, the, from the left, the, the mm -hmm. thought is going to be, you can't do this kind of repair job on liberalism precisely because its central tenets, and I would say this, the liberal conception of democracy, mm -hmm. and say the liberal conception of freedom, mm -hmm. and here I side with the, the sort of capitalism and anti-slavery linkage. Mm -hmm. I even think the liberal conception of, of human rights, yes. which derives after all from Locke, sure. and then gets modified mm -hmm. by kind of the French in ways that I think are intrinsically imperative. Mm -hmm. All those things are in the service of capitalism. Intrinsic to and then this. and if that's true, mm -hmm. I think capitalism is intrinsically imperialist and colonialist. Mm -hmm. It needs and classes, obviously, mm -hmm. it needs an underclass. And I think it's not a very big move from there to intrinsically hierarchical hierarchical with respect to other aspects of social identity, including mm -hmm. gender and race. Mm -hmm. So can you can you get a liberalism without capitalism? Is that what we want? And if not, can that liberalism ever get rid of colonialism? Right. Well, I guess one of the arguments, counter arguments, would be capitalism itself comes in different variants. Mm -hmm. And the capitalism you have in the United States now is different from sort of Swedish social democratic capitalism, redistributivist capitalism. I mean, you know, Denmark, as you know, was um, the sort of a. <laughs> This is not Denmark, but hey, I mean, I saw you look at the Scandinavian continent. Those great anti racists. I'm sorry? Those great anti Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So um, I think the question we need to ask is even if it's a capitalist society, which it is, does it have to be plutocratic capitalism? And um, there's this guy, Douglas Massing, and he had this book, Categorically Unequal, and I don't know what he coined the phrase, but the phrase was egalitarian capitalism. Now, before you burst into laughter and say that like jumbo shrimp and business ethics, something, <laughs> <laughs> he, he must have said, you know, and, and, and the book is sort of filled with charts and graphs on every page. He said, look at the income and wealth differentials in the 1930s to 1970s. They're far less extreme. And of course, part of course, that's, that's the Great Depression as World War II, and, and you saw the people be drawn to come for the war effort and so forth. Nonetheless, basically says, you get the sort of take off the capitalism we have now in the US, based as a result of things like you know, um, new regulation, new regular revolution, and so forth. So these are not sort of necessary, sort of predetermined stages of capitalism. These had to do with particular political battles being you know, you know war, the battles being lost. And you can imagine a situation where you have a national movement which you know, is won over by a social democratic ideal, and they could act as a countervailing force so that you get a more redistributivist cap, um, sort of cap, cap, capitalist system. So I guess my argument would be, if, that, if what you're saying were true, then the capitalism of all the nations currently on the planet would be the same. But you know, they're quite different, some are more redistributivist than others. So why is the US so different? So you sort of point a particular history there. And then you say, well, you know, maybe you can overcome the forces that sort of led to that kind of capitalism, given that even the white working class are now suffering more than they did before. So part of the point of um, sort of the I just sort of trying to, to break off this section is pressed because of the fact that the sort of post-war hegemony you know, that the US enjoyed in the global economy, that's a thing of the past. So, you know, you must have seen the story about the surprising sort of suicide rates of, you know, poor whites. You know, where did that come from? It comes in part because the system is not working for the white population as a whole the way it used to. And that could create the opening for this transracial lens. 
Um, it's like a seal from the chair. Um, thanks. Enjoyed the talk very much. Um, I was wondering, I had, I had a concern at a point that um, you made some some good disparaging remarks about the usefulness of philosophy for for what you were doing. And then you said you were finding better work in political theory. But then by the time the end of the talk came around and you had a good account of what corrective justice would consist in and the broad sweep of political theory, of course, needlessly not all political theory spectrum would fall you know, would be persuaded or moved by that theoretically. But it was really quite a wide range, as you said. You could go all the way out, and, and it seemed sufficient to take theories that are quite ideal and quite classic, like Locke's, and just conjoin them with consciousness of relevant empirical facts, yeah. and you're saying you would get the right kinds of outcomes. You'd get, yeah. you know, you could see that demand would be unignorable. So it seemed to me at the end that the theory in terms of the political action and realizing mm -hmm. the idea of corrective justice, the theory dropped out as mm -hmm. not completely irrelevant, but significantly less relevant, even political theory, let alone philosophical theory. Okay. Is, that, is that a fair um, okay. assessment? I guess I won't resist that to a certain extent, because my claim is that you know, the theory is doing work insofar as you make a normative case for corrective justice. So I guess I want to sort of see that as a philosophical contribution, where the justice guys if you look at, you know, where the work on racial justice is being done, it's not for the most part in the work of political philosophers. It's like the civil rights community, it's in the people doing sociology and so forth. So I would want to see philosophers to sort of, you know, step up boldly and say, hey, we're the ones who are supposed to have the franchise, we haven't done a good job, but, you know, we're doing our back, we're sort of do our racial justice thing. And we have this sort of sophisticated array of concepts, which you lesser humans, oops, I mean, you know, I did that part, but we have this long history of doing you know, sort of sophisticated stuff, even though we haven't done it on a race. And you know, we're now going to show you that there are really good arguments for racial justice. Now, I um, give what I said earlier, I don't think moral suasion makes the world go wrong, but insofar as a moral argument is at least you know, part of a movement for radical social change, it's sort of Gramscian tradition, you know, try to do anti-hegemonic stuff, even if it's not the case that you rely solely on moral arguments, then I think you know, philosophy does have a distinctive role to play. Oh, no, no. Oh, I'm switch, sorry. Switch, switches to, 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 to the other side, yes. So, um, you've said a lot about what can be done with corrective justice yes. mechanisms, especially when economic wrongs have been done yes. or when violent wrongs have been done. And I'm curious about, I guess, a specific subset of those. And that is when conquest has been done to somebody. And thinking specifically in terms of Native Americans and other indigenous peoples, when they've been conquered, and what groups now want is sovereignty or separatism. Correct. Is there a way to work this in, especially when it comes to the transracial alliance convincing supposedly center right capitalists, I suppose. Yeah. Can they be convinced? Uh, right. Yeah, good, good, yeah, excellent point. Uh, by the transracial lands, I was really thinking of, you know, groups who are sort of incorporated within the U.S. to a greater extent, such as black Americans are, despite everything, um, such as Asian American and, and, and Latin immigrants and so on. But Native Americans are in a really sort of separate category. Now, there are attempts to sort of make liberalism consistent with that. Think of the work of Will Kimlicker, for example, and multiculturalism, or James, well, well Tully's a, Tull is a, like it's a, 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 a James Kimlicker rather than Tully. So there are attempts there to sort of say, you know, sort of, you know, you can recognize the sovereignty of indigenous nations. But I agree with you that that's a much more complicated case, because for, for a similar number of native peoples, and none of this would be satisfactory. Because the idea would be, we never accepted this in the first place, and it's unrealistic at this stage to say Europeans go home, but maybe some people still go home that time. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I agree with you that that raises questions that are much deeper and more problematic. Yes. And then I want the last one. Okay. So, um, what was interesting to me is that this was an odd frame in terms of views of justice, but one would think, given the big disparities between moral views or at least empirical understandings of the world between blacks and whites, uh, you know, whatever the Europeans and the countries they colonized, that what's also important is who has the power to make the political decision.
is and what kind of democratic theory would you think would be required or what kinds of transformations in democratic theory to make it possible so that, for example, when textbooks are written on history, that it's not just done by whites and, and, and conservative blacks, but you know that there's some kind of uh, representation yes. of those who have a view. So I was wondering if you have any commitment to revisions of democratic theory as part of your project, or that you would see as a conclusion. Yeah. Um. Okay, other work have argued for three principles of corrective racial justice um, centered on citizenship, on economic exploitation and marginalization, and on disrespect. So certainly citizenship, you could sort of see that as sort of involving question of justice given the pattern of what's called white majoritarianism in the sense that uh, democratic theory the idea is that democratic vote is not supposed to infringe on you know, the sort of rights of unpopular minorities, but in fact the history of the U.S. has been one of white, white majoritarianism, and this has been sort of maintained even with the, the vote, and of course as well, the Voting Rights Act has been weakened by the Supreme Court Shelby decision, but even you know, with a sort of strong Voting Rights Act in place, you still have a situation of you know, vast and disproportionate um, white representation across the country in terms of government bodies. So you know, how do you address this? Well, you know, one argument is that democratic theory taking non-ideal racial realities into account would have to be transformed significantly. The person that side here is Lenny Guinera, who a few of us in the room are old enough to remember was nominated by the Clinton <laughs> White House before the political right discovered the paper trail and then Clinton ran sort of in, in hiding and that was the end of Lenny Lene Guinera. But part of her argument was that in order to achieve democracy, when you have a permanent majority of whites, so sort of using Madison's concept of permanent majority of that race, you're going to need mechanisms like in a sort of supermajority voting and other kinds of things. And that these might seem anti-liberal, but they're not anti-liberal. They're um, liberal in a non-ideal context of white racial domination. So I'm claiming that it's sort of congruent to my overall line of argument, which is that liberalism has to be rethought in a non-ideal circumstance in which we find ourselves, and we then get conclusions which seem anti-liberal, but are arguably can be shown the sort of consequences of you know, the commitment to liberal rights and freedoms under these circumstances which you know, most mainstream liberals ignore. So yes, I agree with you that um, um, democratic theory would have to be thought, given this pattern. I could say maybe we're moving towards a situation where we're getting a non-white majority anyway. That has been challenged by other people. Um, there's a new political, sorry, so sorry, I said Eduardo Bunia Silva, and Eduardo argues we're moving towards the Latin model, the Latin model of race, which means that you get an expansion of whiteness so as to let in people who are not admitted before. So for example, um, the Latinos of European origins, maybe, maybe some Asian groups, maybe you can cross the few blacks and blacks. <laughs> so you would then get, um, it would still be a white majority, but the terms of whiteness would be, it would be sort of defined differently. So, you know, it's not that we just sort of sit back and wait for the sort of you know, impending on, on, on white majority. So yes, I, I agree with you that um, so far as liberal democracy, then it's not just justice, but democratic theory itself, which is going to sort of need some sort of rethinking re re on this basis. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to finish up because we're already past uh, six o'clock with a very brief comment and then one question. The brief comment is there's quite a bit of work done in the environmental movement uh, okay. with race okay. because, of course, people of color and poverty, they seem to get all this, you know, trash dumped on them and not, all that. Not, not in my backyard and so forth. Yeah, and you know, all the buses turn around in Harlem and you know, the asthma rates are very high. So there's a, a real correlation with race and um, environmental injustice. So it would just seem this you know, could be brought in. But my question is something people have come up, you know, in different ways come up with this. And I'm trying to understand your argument. You're saying we can use a Lockean self or for certain things like property rights. And that would be an argument for the right wing. And then on the left, uh, uh, we need a different 
we need, need a different conception. And my, my question is, where is the motivation for a memorialization of these? It's not from Locke, no, the memorialization true. of all the, yeah. the millions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, oh, Kant's a lot richer, uh, let me yeah, just say. Uh, but, uh, zero, so and yeah. then, oh, because it's really confusing to me, yeah. and then you also think of, you, you mentioned feminist theory as uh, an inspiration on media, yes, yeah. and the whole, it seems to me, mu much of what feminism is doing is altering that this Lockean model is a very small, tiny percentage of human yeah. uh, creatures, most of, uh, most people of color come from a much more communal background, uh, maybe we should be fleshing that out a lot yes. stronger, or the and the emotions and, and whatever that is lacking from yes. the yeah. early, so I'm just, you can say one word or two at the end and that's it. And Mario Cousins. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay with me. So thank you very much.